scripture this morning is 1 Samuel 24, 8 through 15. Please follow along in your pew Bibles. That would be on page 268 and 269 in the Old Testament. Afterwards, David also rose up and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the King! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down with his face to the ground and did obeisance. David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of those who say, David seeks to do you harm? This very day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you into my hand in the cave. And some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not raise my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your cloak in my hand? For the fact that I cut off the corner of your cloak and did not kill you, you may know for certain that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you are hunting me to take my life. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the ancient proverb says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A single flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you. May he see to it and plead my cause and vindicate me against you. The last Sunday after worship, one of our church members came up to me and asked me why I always standing right this side when I preach the sermon. So today I'm going to move my <laughs> position, stand right here, so make sure you see me, see me, okay? Shall we pray? But thank you so much for this time, and we're asking for your spiritual discernment and knowledge, so may you understand your word and apply it to our lives. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> now today we're talking about justice, and justice in Hebrew means tzedak, means right thing to do. The definition of justice is very broad, and right thing to do is very really broad. Some people might think that the justice is a punishment, they bring a punishment to those who bad people. But punishment is a part of justice, but not the whole justice. So it's hard to understand what justice is from our perspective. Now, there is a book, a best-selling book, came out 2009. We have a picture, actually. A Harvard professor, Michael, uh, Michael yeah, Sandel, wrote this book in 2009, it was number one bestseller. Of course, you know, it all happens to be New York Times bestseller. And Michael said that everyone wants justice. But the problem is everyone has different definition of justice. Every political party has different definition of justice. Every person has a different definition of justice. So we all bumped into one another trying to get justice. And other people say that's the most injustice thing you could have done trying to get justice. So what I think is justice might be injustice to you. What I think is appropriate might be inappropriate to some other people. Last week, I had a chance to talk to my friend uh, who is a pastor in Korea, and our conversation actually ended up you know, sharing our sermon content. So I told him that my sermon topic is going to be uh, justice. 
then he told me about what he thinks, what he does is right, might be wrong in this country. Then he sent me a picture of him talking to one of his uh, elders. We have a picture actually, yeah, right there. The guy who the, who's on the right side is my friend. And on the left side is one of his church members. Since my friend is younger than him, he bows and listens to him. It's pretty typical and normal conversation you can see in Korea. It's pretty normal, very appropriate. What if I do this here? Every time you talk to me, I bow, never talk. You know, once in a while, you guys bring me you know, homegrown vegetable. Every time you bring me homegrown vegetable, I say, 감사합니다. 대단히 감사합니다. You know my intention. First time you might understand, but second time you might feel strange, you know, weird. In Korea, it's very appropriate. Here, it's very inappropriate. So then what's the best way to build a relationship in this country? What's the best way to have a good conversation here? This is what we do in this country. <laughs> Sue is my good friend. I'm younger than her, little younger than her. <laughs> and she and I are good friends. So it's very appropriate that I put my arms around her and goofing around. And fooling around. This is what we do as a friend. But in Korea, it's very disrespectful. I am very rude. I'm very impolite because I'm a pastor. I shouldn't wear a devil uh, wig. I shouldn't put my arms around any church members in Korea. I will be in a big trouble in Korea. But here it's funny. Here it's okay. But in Korea, it's very inappropriate. In the last week, you can take it up. <laughs> I am very embarrassed. Last year, my friends, my parents, as you know, visiting a uh, alliance, and our church provided a small reception. At the reception, I was talking to one of uh, our church members. I forgot who the person was. But what I did, actually I'm going to show you, I'm going to go down actually. I know this is Presbyterian church, I shouldn't go down here. But actually I came up to the person, no, can, would you, can you stand up for two seconds? I was talking to uh, the, the person, he's, you know, he's older than me, I was talking and I put my eyes, you know, hey, no, how are you? I'm fine. Good. You know, I like this. It's just very normal. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Yeah. It's pretty normal. It's a sign of you know, friendship. But my parents were standing behind me. My mom talked to me. Put your hands down. Take your hands off. That's very rude. That's very impolite. That's disrespectful. So to my mom's side, what I did to the church members, was very disrespectful. Here is a friendly attitude, but there is very disrespectful. I'm not talking about cultural differences or conversational etiquette, but what I'm talking about our view or moral standard or the definition of justice depend on who it is and what social and cultural circumstances you may live. You might think that what you do is right, but to some other people might be very inappropriate. So our moral standards are different. Depends on where you live, what kind of culture you grew up. When you look at David's life, we can see full of injustice. Looking at his life from a human point of view, we see a lot of inappropriate, lot of unfair things happen to David. Now, first of all, 
When David was young, he was taking care of his father's animal in the field. Then Samuel visited his family house, but somehow David was left out. He was not invited to the meeting. Now, Samuel was a big time guy. He was very famous. Probably every town came to David's house to meet Prophet Samuel. But somehow David was excluded from the family. And just he by himself taking care of his father's animal. It could more make sense if his brother were in the field taking care of the, uh, the animal. But David was there. So it's not really fair. The second thing is, David didn't volunteer to be king. All of a sudden, a Samuel came and ordained him with an oil. And he just left. When you look at this event, it's very unfair, very risky. Because being ordained with oil is official ceremony. Official coronation. If Saul, Saul figures out Samuel holding another person to be king, David's life would be danger, would be risky. Now I'm going to read a passage of 1 Samuel chapter actually 10. Would you put it up the screen so you can see? 1 Samuel chapter 10, here uh, Samuel ordained Saul, verse 1, Samuel took a vial of, a of oil and poured it on his head, his and Saul's head, and kissed him, and he said, The Lord has anointed you rule over his people Israel. And verse 17, Samuel summoned the people to the Lord at Mizpah. And said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought us Israel out of Egypt. It's right there. So it means that as soon as Saul anointed, as soon as Samuel anointed Saul, Saul becomes the king. It's right there. But when you go back to Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, I mean David, in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mighty upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. So Samuel anointed David, then he just left without giving him any proper direction and guidance. It's not really fair. David didn't even know what that was all about. He was just a boy. He could be 11 or 13 years old. We don't know exactly how old he was. But all of a sudden, he was old then to be the king. He is the king there. People say he is the king. Then Samuel just left without giving him any proper direction. His life would be risky. That's why in today's chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 24, David is a fugitive for 13 years. He didn't know why he has to be, why he has to be running away from Saul. He is hiding in a cave which is called the rocks of the wild goat, which is barren, dry, and a rocky desert. He is hiding there with his followers for 13 years. David is king elect. In chapter 24, it's probably it's been a 12 years since he's been uh, running away from Saul. It's been 12 years. He is king elect. He still remembers Saul's of uh, Samuel's hand on his head and oil coming from coming down the back of his head. He's king elect. But chapter 24, he's still running away from Saul. 
Saul figures out where uh, David is hiding, so he gathered 3,000 special operation forces. It's a rocky mountain. It's not just regular soldier. It's a special soldier, maybe Delta Force, I don't know, maybe Navy SEAL, I don't know. 3,000 special forces hunting down David there. It's not really fair. What did David do wrong here? What did he do? Will is God. Will is justice for David. First of all, he didn't want, he didn't volunteer to be king. He didn't ask Samuel to ordain him. Then Samuel came and ordained him, then he just left. David probably didn't know why all these things happened to me. Now, sometimes we ask the same question in our lives. Where is God? Why these things happen to me? Why do all those innocent children suffer and die? Why all those innocent people starve and die? Where was God when the crazy man in Las Vegas shoot and killed you know, 60 people and wounded 500 people. Where was God? Then the guy, he killed himself. That's not fair. Killing himself could have, must be part of his plan. The killing is like playing a video game to him. From, from the how, 38th floor? I forgot. 44th floor? 37th? 32. 32. Thank you. Killing those people, it's like a video game. Then he killed himself. It's not fair. People, people want to bring justice to him, but he's not here. He's gone. So it's not really fair. It's injustice to those who lost their families. We have all kinds of questions in our lives regarding all the events happen in our lives. In our in our lives. But the thing is, when you look at our lives from a human point of view, your life might not make sense at all. All the things happened in the past, we want to know what it happened, we want to get the explanation, but as long as we see it from our point of view, it doesn't make sense. Because our view is relative. Our knowledge and our experience are limited to understand all the things happen in our life. That's why David looks at his life from God's perspective. He doesn't look at his life from a human perspective. He looked at his life, he looked at something people cannot see from human perspective. That's what uh, David can understand. David can see God's purpose, God's plan in his life. He learned this. He probably learned God's purpose and his plan in his life. He learned this secret when he was left alone in the field. That's why Samuel probably left David alone in the field so David could learn who truly God is. What his plan, what his purpose for his life. David learned the secret in the field. In the field, taking care of his, his father's animal. In the wilderness, he's running away. He learned that God is the only one who he can trust. God is the only one who his, his purpose, guidance, direction, or strength, fortress. He learned this through the times of running away, through the times of being alone at night, taking care of his family, his, his animal. So he learned that, not just in his head, but in his heart. That's why God chose him to be the greatest king in Israel history. He sees truly he see God's true purpose in all the things happen in his life. Because he doesn't see it from human point of view. He sees it God's point of view. So everything makes sense to him. 
That's why in today's chapter, he has a perfect chance to kill Samuel. Samuel is right there. I mean, I'm sorry, Saul. Saul is right there. Saul didn't even know that David and his followers are hiding in the cave. So Saul just walked in. That David is hiding deep inside of the cave. But he didn't take the chance because he sees God's purpose and his plan even in Saul's life. God who ordained Saul can handle also his life. That's David's faith. That's your true faith. David has truly believed God's authority and his sovereignty. That's your true faith. That's your true faith you and I should have. We should believe God's sovereignty and his control in our life. That's true faith. Maybe I can guess David's follower question, David, why don't you just kill Saul? You can kill him, become the king. It's a perfect chance. Maybe they think David might be confused. He might be realistic. He might not be realistic. He might make a mistake. They might be disappointed because David doesn't do, doesn't take the perfect chance. You know, that's what average people do and think. Average people take what they see in their hand. That's what average people do. But God doesn't want us to be average. God wants us to be excellent. God wants us to go deeper and see what's purpose in our life. That's why David refused to kill Saul because he sees God's purpose and his plan in his life. You know, I have a friend, my best friend. We've been friends for 20, uh, almost 20 years since college. And he married uh, eight years ago, actually, eight years ago. And before he married, while he was dating with his girlfriend, I strongly object to his girlfriend, actually, very strongly. And I told him, don't go out with her, don't date with her, because she is not Christian. She doesn't want to go to church. She is an extreme, what do you call, political activist, participating in all kinds of political uh, events against government, doesn't matter Democrat or Republic. Her personality is very short-tempered, very energetic, doesn't really fit into my friend's personality, so I object. I even call other friends, hey, we need to stop Mike. You know, he's going to marry this girl, and he's going to marry within a year, he's going to divorce within a year after marry. What kind of wonderful friend I was at the time. Then he decided to marry her, and I was, since I'm his best friend, I was in the wedding, you know, I blessed him anyway. You know, he's my friend. I blessed him. Now it's been eight years, and they have one boy, a happy marriage, and she goes to a church. She even joins choir, good Christian, no political activist. She doesn't go to that kind of meeting anymore, and she loves Christ. She's a good supporter for my ministry right now. Before left LA for you know, uh, Nebraska, she met even lunch and snack. They wrote me a really long letter about you know, whenever I met her, our relationship was kind of awkward. But she knew I didn't really like her. But she wrote me a, a long letter in 2005 and at the end she said, I'm following Christ so I love my enemy. I'm thinking, who is your enemy? <laughs> yeah, I used to be her enemy. I didn't see Christ who my friend saw eight years ago in her heart. I didn't see possibility, opportunity that God would bring into her heart, but my friend saw it. 
So I judged my friend. I evaluated my friend's girlfriend at the time with my moral standard, with my spiritual standard. Now she becomes a different person. Now she's a faithful follower of Christ. Who can judge us? Who can evaluate what we do and why we do? People might not understand you. People might be uh, sarcastic because they don't see Christ who you see in your life. They don't hear what you hear from the Lord. They don't understand why you have to move. Why you have to sell your house, why you buy your house, why you leave your job, why you take this job, why you marry this person. They don't understand because they don't see Christ in you. Christ customized your life. He orchestrated your life and made perfect fit into your life. With my perspective, with my moral standard, With my spiritual uh, standard, I'm not able to see you. Whether I criticize you, I judge you, I discern what you do with my discernment, which could be completely wrong. That's why Christ should be the center of our life. That's why Christ is the anchor of our life. So we wouldn't be shaken. We couldn't be shaken when people a sarcastic of you when people don't understand you when people push over you you stay right there because Christ has a purpose for you Christ has a plan for your life that's why we should stick to Christ invite Christ our lives every single day whatever we do because we face challenge every single moment what we do but people don't see what we do Because they don't see Christ in our lives. I don't see, I might not be able to see Christ in your life. You are the only one who can discern and see Christ in your life. What do you see in your life? What perspective do you have? What kind of view do you have? Look at your life from God's perspective. Then your life will makes sense. Your life makes sense why you had to go through all those events in the past and why you are here right now. When you take out Christ, it just doesn't make sense. When you put Christ in the center of your life, then truly you can see, ah, that's why, that's why I was there. That's why I had to go through what I had to go through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for our lives free of anxiety and fear and grateful for the cross that takes away our burdens. Under the cross, we find forgiveness for salvation, strength to go on, and the ability to recover. Help us, Father, in this world, of fight, hardship, sudden surprise, and brokenness. We can fight the good fight of faith when we truly see our lives from your grace and your love. Then it really makes sense to us. Every day in our lives we see or even experience tragedy and accident and no one can explain why. Help us trust in you, Lord. Someday we will get all the answers that we are looking for. In your name we pray. Amen.